Part 1 of Europe in the Middle of the 17th Century by Martin Philipson from The History of All Nations from Earliest Times Volume 13 The Age of Louis XIV translated under the supervision of John Henry Wright This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by Piotr Nather. To its great loss, Germany had for thirty years been the centre of the political and military activity of Europe. Seldom has a people been stricken with such a calamity as were the Germans, through the ruinous war for religion. That the country not only survived, but gradually elevated itself from its wretched state, is a proof of its indestructible vitality and essential soundness. The numerical strength of the armies was not such as utterly to ruin, even by their long-continued presence, a country so rich as the Germany of the beginning of the 17th century. The actual armies did not average in number more than 30,000 to 40,000 men, but camp followers hung about the combatants, and they too had to be fed. At the end of the war, the united imperial Bavarian army comprised 40,000 soldiers who drew rations, and 140,000 camp followers who got nothing. All these had to live at the cost of the peaceful, industrious population. As the pay was much higher then than it is now in the German armies, it was invariably in arrears, and the soldiers had to resort to plundering to maintain themselves. When they had once entered on the path of violence, there was no means of checking them in their wild career. In their depredations they halted at nothing. Rank, sex, place were not sacred to them. Violence was done to churches, altars, and even to graves. Robbery, burning, torture, and murder were perpetrated from sheer delight therein, on friend and foe alike. From all over Germany, from Pomerania to Swabia, from East Friesland to Austria, arose, with terrible uniformity, the same wail of despair. Imperialists, Leaguists, Swedes, Hessians, Bavarians alike, fell upon the peaceful homesteads, took all that was of worth to them, destroyed and devastated the rest, wantonly slaughtered the cattle, wasted the fields and orchards, tortured the inhabitants to extort from them a disclosure of their hidden valuables, outraged women, and dragged the most beautiful away with them and sold them like cattle. On their departure they not seldom set fire to the villages and towns. Even the forests were burned down, and the fishponds drained, out of mere wantonness. When a place defended itself, all the inhabitants were ruthlessly murdered, except the few rich, from whom they sought to secure ransoms, by the most fiendish tortures of all kinds. It was a favorite amusement of these monsters to impale helpless infants, dash them against walls, or roast them in stoves. In short, the soldier's motto was, whoever owns anything is our foe nor were the leaders more forbearing than their men. Count Königsmark, once a poor German page, carried off enough to Sweden to leave his family a yearly income of 130,000 thalers. Footnote. The thaler was a silver coin having an intrinsic value of 72 cents, but it must be remembered that the purchasing power of money was three times as great at the period of the Thirty Years' War as at present. End of footnote. To these devastations by the soldiery and the heavy taxes imposed for the maintenance of the troops, there were added the exorbitant war contributions levied by the generals from hostile towns and districts. In one small section of Hanover, Tilly, within three years, exacted two million thalers. In one single year, the little town of Goslar had to contribute 544,000 thalers. Brandenburg was laid under contribution by Wallenstein, and Mantecuccioli to the amount of twenty million thalers, and so on through a long list. The distress was universal. Business and exchange of every kind were further harmed by the debasement of the coinage, which was practiced by all the German princes, especially in the years 1621 to 1623, Brunswick having set the example. In place of standard metal, the coins were composed of copper or simply of sheet iron, lightly silvered over. No one would accept them at their normal value, and the uncertainty and confusion became so great that dealers and innkeepers took down their signs. 
so-called money was in abundance but no one could get anything like its face value for it a good thaler sold for eight fifteen and at last twenty thalers of the debased coinage a bushel of corn brought forty thalers of such money a pitcher of wine one hundred and thirty at last the taxes were paid in the debased money and the gain slipped through the fingers of the princes then they remedied matters by calling in the new coinage at its real worth and issuing coins of full value but they had defrauded their poor subjects to the extent of the difference in value between the debased and the genuine money and had done irretrievable injury to business all industries were at standstill even the busy hands of the husbandmen was addressed whole villages died out multitudes concealed themselves in forests caves and ravines hunger gnawed the vitals of the people who in their anguish ate human flesh and even broke into graves ascended the gallows and robbed the wheel to prey on the corpses there men fought over horse flesh and slew one another more terrible still men slaughtered human beings especially defenceless children that they might devour them these horrors are not fables but facts reported by eye-witnesses hundreds of times in consequence of famine and unwholesome food typhus fever and other contagious diseases broke out and carried off what the sword had spared during the siege of augsburg by the imperialists in sixteen thirty four sixty thousand citizens and country people who had taken refuge within the walls died in munich alone then a town of only moderate size fifteen thousand people perished within a year the fever penetrated the remotest districts and most secluded mountain valleys on all roads were to be seen pest chapels erected to deliver the land from the terrible scourge it was at this time that the natives of oberammergau in upper bavaria with the same object instituted the passion play no wonder that the result was an enormous decrease in the population in all parts of germany the effects of which continue to this day it has been estimated that the population of the empire in sixteen forty eight was only a third of what it was in sixteen eighteen in brandenburg by sixteen thirty many cities were so nearly desolate that half of the houses were uninhabited and the severest devastations were yet to come berlin which suffered comparatively little from the war numbered at its close not more than three hundred burghers in saxony the wolves multiplied to such an extent that they entered the villages and even the smaller towns in bands in dresden the entire suburbs were torn down or burned the city itself contained only the fifteenth part of its former population in thuringia whole districts lay in ashes the younger men had been drafted off to the war in which most of them had perished while the older people had either fled or succumbed to pestilence and the hardships of war in the county of henneberg for example the population had sunk from sixty one thousand to sixteen thousand and even at the present day many towns have not recovered the population which they had in sixteen eighteen in nassau the villages dwindled away to a few houses and were often entirely deserted in wiesbaden the market-place and many streets were overgrown with thorns and brush so that hares and partridges bred among them other streets had disappeared entirely and become merged in the forest in franconia the depopulation was so great that every man was allowed to take two wives and no man under sixty could enter a monastery in württemberg three hundred and twelve clergymen died in one year and at christmas sixteen thirty five over one hundred churches were without priests many other cases could be cited to illustrate the universal desolation at the end of thirty years war a contemporaneous work extidium germaniae depicts the condition of the country as follows quote, one may travel forty miles without seeing man or beast except that in a village here and there you find an old man and a child or two old women in all the villages the houses are filled with the stench of carcasses men wife children servants horses swine cows and oxen lying intermingled slain by pest and hunger and not at by wolves dogs and carrion crows because there is no one left to bury them End quote how had the german cities formerly the main seats of german culture degenerated 
though since the time of the Reformation they had lost much of their earlier political importance through the continually increasing power of the territorial princes, they had remained comfortable and industrious, and at the beginning of the war were the seats of a pleasant social life. Their edifices rose stately and strong within their tower-crowned walls, their streets were well paved, and their water supply and drainage carefully provided for. They were still, in 1618, the guardians of German civilization, but the cities were both morally and materially injured by the debasement of the coinage, even at the beginning of the war. Then the armies began to roll past them, putting a stop to business and industry. Next, these demanded admission within the walls, and quarters, maintenance, and contributions, the soldiers perpetrating all possible excesses. Finally came the storming and capture of numerous cities, which all but annihilated them for a time. Pestilence and hunger did their fatal work. Nor did the free imperial cities fare better than the provincial towns. The Hanseatic League also came to an end, King Christian IV annulling its last privileges in Denmark and Norway. In 1628 it held its last diet, only to announce the breaking up of the ancient union with the humiliating declaration that, quote, the northern kings are the rulers appointed by God over the seas washing the German coast, end quote. Three cities, Hamburg, Bremen, and Lübeck, which still continued the name of the Hansa, maintained a carrying trade on a small scale, but even of this the lion's share fell to the foreigners, the traffic being chiefly carried on in English and Dutch ships. Instead of exporting wares, the ships left the harbours of Germany in ballast, and each year fifty or sixty millions of thalers went in this way over the sea, never to be seen again. Individual princes, after the restoration of peace, sought to better the economical condition of their lands, but they did this in accordance with the false views of the mercantile system then prevailing, that is, with one-sided patronage and artificial promotion of the weaker industries to the prejudice of that great branch, which was then by far the most natural and the most profitable for Germany, namely agriculture. The national welfare was checked by unwise restrictions on intercourse and traffic in the interior. Navigation on the rivers was burdened by endless tolls, and was thus rendered impossible for remote distances. Every one of the innumerable little German principalities was hemmed in by almost prohibitive import and export duties. These exactions and impediments to interstate commerce worked all the more harmfully because the empire, split up into so many petty principalities, could not, as against the foreigner, carry out a united commercial policy, nor indeed afford its inhabitants any effective protection against foreign corporations and private merchants. The infinite variety of money, too, and the want of a strict statutory supervision of the various mints threw further obstacles in the way. The consequence was that foreign products had everywhere the advantage over the native. The state of the rural districts was even worse than that of the cities. In spite of all restrictions and obligations, the peasants, before the outbreak of the war, were, especially in West and South Germany, in a condition of material prosperity and comfort. Their houses, though simple in construction, were well provided with furniture and conveniences. They possessed many cattle, and horse-breeding was carried on on a more extensive scale than at present. The sheep yielded a fine, universally prized wool, which, when converted into cloths, formed a favorite article of export. The culture of the vine, too, was then common in many districts where it is no longer followed. But after 1618 all this changed. The peasant was first defrauded by the debasement of the currency, then came the burdensome taxes for war purposes, and finally the armies, as previously described, devastated and desolated everywhere. How, after the return of peace, were the wretched conditions to be even mitigated? The peasants' dwellings were in ruins, their cattle slaughtered or driven off, their orchards cut down, their furniture destroyed, their money gone. Many discharged soldiers did indeed again lay hold of the axe and plough, but they were often possessed by the wild, unruly spirit engendered by war, and could not easily reconcile themselves to humdrum everyday village life. With the purpose of taming these turbulent elements, 
the greater landowners drew the bonds of vassalage even tighter, and the social relations of the peasants became more and more oppressive. The peasant vegetated, pent in like his cattle, kept in awe by his parson through the dread of hellfire, regularly shorn by his landlord and sovereign, or led off to the battlefield in his own or a foreign country. Nor did the landowners lie on beds of roses. They lived on their impoverished and wasted possessions, for the most part crushed down by debts and lawsuits. Loans by which to repair the ravages of war were difficult to obtain, and then only at exorbitant interest. Many nobles had to leave home and court, and attach themselves as satellites to their more fortunate brethren. Terrible as was Germany's material suffering from this cruel war, the intellectual and moral degeneracy was still worse. Pecuniary losses would have been made good with time, had the people's spiritual nature been left uncorrupted. But this was not so, and even at the present day, the wounds that the Thirty Years' War inflicted on German character are scarcely healed. A turbulent, gross, lawless temper, averse to work of any kind, took possession of all classes in the empire. The life of a highwayman or a vagrant beggar was more congenial to many than the hard constraints of honest labor. In Bavaria and many other places, gypsies, swindlers, and vagabonds of all sorts swarmed in bands over the country. If the elector determined to go on a pilgrimage, he had first, for his own safety, to send out scouring parties to clear the roads. Since no one was sure of the future, the rule was to make the most of the present. How could noble conceptions, refinement of manners, regard for what is sacred, and a taste for higher enjoyments develop in a period of such vicissitude and barbarism? Nor did the wild manner of living disappear immediately after 1648. The misery of the times, says one, instead of bettering the people, made them worse. Profligacy, impunity, and kindred vices became daily more rampant, and all efforts to check them were in vain. This is most clearly proved by the frequent and repeated ordinances against the desecration of Sunday and Saints' days, dancing, drunken carousels, night brawls and clamour, cursing, fornication and adultery, excesses at marriages and feasts, etc. How universally did superstition and fanaticism gain the upper hand, while young and old showed the greatest indifference to religion? Such was the condition of Germany at the close of the Thirty Years' War. The prevalent degeneracy was aggravated by the fact that the clergy suffered more than almost any other class through the war. On the ministers of an alien faith, the soldiers fell with a special fury, and care for the souls of the sick carried off numbers during the pestilence. The devastation of many universities, combined with the poverty of most congregations, checked the supply of new candidates. Education, too, suffered scarcely less severely. How wretched the condition of the teachers was, is shown by ordinances issued in more places than one, interdicting the clergy from employing schoolmasters too often in their domestic service, as in sowing wood and threshing wheat. A seemingly paradoxical phenomenon of the times was boundless extravagance in dress and ornaments, and glutinous excess in eating and drinking. Innumerable sumptuary laws show the prevalence of the evil, though they appear to have been without effect. In Leipzig, the maid servants were summoned before the city council for wearing trains and laces forbidden to people of their class, and the gigos were torn from them. But such attempts to prevent extravagance were unsuccessful. People thought it better to squander what they possessed in luxury and riotous living than to let it fall into the hands of those who spared nothing. Even the priesthood shared this feeling, and promoted it by encouraging lavish display on high festivals. The higher classes set an example of prodigality and frivolity, which found ready imitation among those beneath them. The workmen's ancient pride in honest work vanished. The decadence of German manufacturers, which had been wrongly ascribed to the modern system of economical freedom, took its origin in the Thirty Years' War. The coarse scepticism and the struggle after merely material interests, characteristic of the epoch, were perfectly compatible with the densest superstition. The terrors amid which everyone lived 
beclouded the moral nature of even the best disposed, and delivered them over to the gloomy frenzy of delusion. Soldiers believed that they could fortify themselves by charms against the enemy's weapons. A whole literature gathered round this black art, which was, however, recognized as coming from the devil, and as ultimately fatal to those who practiced it. In no other age and country did the belief in witchcraft prevail so generally as in Germany at this time, as if the sword, fire, famine, and pestilence had not claimed victims enough, innumerable persons especially women fell victims to the popular delusion about witchcraft the witch commissioners gained renown in proportion to the number of unfortunates whom they caused to be seized and burned in every village a committee was appointed to bring new delinquents to trial in three years from sixteen twenty seven to sixteen twenty nine the bishop of würzburg caused nine hundred witches to be executed nor are we to believe that all these victims were convicted through confessions forced from them by torture. Probably the darkest feature in the whole matter was that many regarded themselves as actually guilty. The horrors of the time and the universal belief in this direful superstition produced hallucinations that convinced many women, young as well as old, that they really had dealings with the evil one and had attended the witch's sabbath. Even the Swedes, who came to Germany untainted by this superstition, became infected by the delusion and returned to kindle the fires of torture in their own land. It was only natural that the protracted civil war should destroy the last relics of national feeling still lingering in the hearts of the German people. These men, who, with the help of foreigners, had for thirty years been slaughtering one another, no longer had a common fatherland. Was it possible for the Protestants to honor, as their emperor and liege lord, that puppet of the Jesuits in Vienna, who was the cause of so much of their sufferings? Even the Catholics saw that these Habsburgs cared only for the power of their house, and not at all for the welfare or greatness of Germany. The feeling of national unity and loyalty for a national emperor was dead. Catholicism was popular, at most, only in Bavaria and some of the ecclesiastical principalities. On the other hand, the meanness, cowardice, and selfishness of the Protestant princes took from their fellow Protestants all confidence in them or pride in their cause. Ultimately, the religious character of the war was thrust into the background, and the contest became entirely one of political selfishness. How could any feeling of nationality or even of local patriotism arise? Little could Germany do to withstand the influence of the foreign soldiers and foreign officers, with their male and female hangers-on, who during the whole course of the war overflowed the land. The German does not have that hard, reserved nature which enables other nationalities to resist the effects of the introduction of foreign elements, even in the Middle Ages, the German nation had opened itself especially to French influences. How much more easy for such to find admission now that all national life, all community of feeling, all pride in country were dead among the Germans. The manner of the foreigners was so confident and imposing, and they appeared so much gayer, richer, and happier, that the poor Germans readily believed that everything was better which came from them, and eagerly imitated them in their manners, speech, and fashions. The special assumption of French modes dates from 1626. Men then began to make themselves ridiculous by imitating the giant perukes of the French court. The beard that the beau up to this time had cultivated and cared for with extraordinary anxiety was now shaved off. The monster peruke hung like a cloud over the beardless face. In like manner, the war mantle gave way to the overcoat, while the jerkin gradually shrank up into the vest. Naturally, the modifications in the female attire were not behind those in the male, the most noticeable being the very low cut of the dresses so as to expose the neck and bust. Unfortunately, this spirit of mimicry prevailed not only in regards to the foreigner, but also in the relations between the different ranks. Everyone cringed before his superiors, to lord it more arrogantly over his inferiors. The princes themselves saw in their subjects only flocks to be shorn to the uttermost. As if in contempt of the reputation of being good housefathers, 
so much coveted by their ancestors, they gave themselves up to revels and extravagances of all kinds. At the same time they endeavoured to appear as mighty monarchs, surrounded themselves with armies, made up perhaps only of a few parade soldiers, with regular courts composed of a host of ministers, privy councillors, and diplomats. For the welfare of his subjects, for a rational financial and civil administration, or for watchfulness over public or private morality, the prince now cared nothing. The nobility flocked to his court, and crowded in devotion around the ruler, that they might share in his brilliant and delightful existence, and be remembered with some portion of the spoil torn from the hapless subjects. Counting the collateral lines of the great princely houses, there were then in Germany at least five hundred to six hundred courtly households, and one thousand five hundred castles, where were found at least six thousand court offices and charges. Every one of them fell to the nobles. With smiles of devotion, these unworthy flatterers bore the humours and insults of the despot and his favourites of either sex, or deliberately placed their wives and daughters as mistresses in his arms. Such men did not trouble themselves about their peasants. The collector of rent and the overseer of labour were all that these saw to remind them of their lord. If the latter chanced to return to his estate, his delight was to pose there as a little sovereign, to surround himself with stringent ceremonials, and to squander his means in splendid buildings and in personal indulgence. The burgher stood in silent awe, not only before the prince, but before his functionaries and officers. He knew no higher ambition than to be admitted into the latter class, and possibly to be dignified with a title. The mania for ennoblement dates entirely from this period. The imperial court took advantage of it to fill its empty coffers by the sale of titles at a fixed tariff. As early as 1654 the Diet complained of this vicious practice. No wonder that all interest in municipal or communal affairs died out, and that maladministration prevailed. The wretched conditions of Germany were not without recognition at the time. This found expression in numberless pamphlets, which, as well as newspapers, were eagerly read. From the beginning of the seventeenth century, newspapers had regularly increased in number in all parts of Germany and Austria. What they lacked in spirit and interest was abundantly supplied by the pamphlets, which exposed and criticized abuses and grievances boldly and incisively, but unfortunately did not have any remedies to propose. However, even during the dreary times of the war and in the following years, efforts at reform were not entirely lacking. There were a few able, conscientious princes, such as Frederick William of Brandenburg, Charles Louis of the Palatinate, and Eberhard of Württemberg, and some honest officials who thought more of the welfare of the people than of their own personal interests or the smile of the ruler, minister, or favorite. Many of the clergy, too, Catholic as well as Protestant, by their piety and devoted self-sacrifice, made up, in some measure, for the evils that their mutual hatred had brought on the land. No department suffered more through the disorders of the war than that of learning. Professors and students vanished before the clash of arms, or became soldiers. Helmstadt, in 1624, numbered 400 students. Two years later, its lecture rooms were empty, and its professors, with one solitary exception, had fled. In Heidelberg, in 1626, there were but two students. In Jena, the number of newcomers was reduced to two-thirds. The universal poverty deprived the university teachers of their bread. Many betook themselves to foreign lands, others perished in penury. Even among the youths who continued to study, an incredible grossness and brutality prevailed the result of intercourse with the soldiery. The worst scholastic outrage was the penalism, that is, the systematic abuse of the newcomers, penals, by the older students, scoristen. These inhuman practices finally became so outrageous that the Diet felt compelled to intervene and enact severe penalties. The teaching itself was lifeless and pedantic, encumbered by the bonds of rigid orthodoxy and servile adherence to precedent. 
the professors were the first to introduce among their students the unworthy distinction of nobles and civilians. In the domains of secondary education, John Amos Comenius, 1592-1670, a Protestant preacher and teacher of Moravia, made an earnest attempt at reform. Driven from his native land by the counter-reformation, he led a wandering life in Germany, England, Sweden, Hungary, and Holland. His educational writings gained him great fame, but little gold. Unweariedly he preached a natural and God-fearing system of education as the best cure for the moral disease of the time. Up to this time, and later also, eloquence had formed the main subject of study. His foundation principle was that a knowledge of things should precede the study of works, therefore an acquaintance with actual objects, as those of nature, science, and art, should precede the study of dialectics and rhetoric, so that these might not be a mere word-play without substance and meaning. It is to be regretted that the French fashion of the times and the incapacity of the teachers suffered the seeds sown by Comenius to die without bearing fruit. Nor was the German love for investigation and practical invention entirely quenched by the Thirty Years' War. In 1650, Otto van Gericke invented the air pump, and four years later he demonstrated its efficiency before the Diet of Ratisbon by the experiment of the Magdeburg hemispheres, so called from Gericke being mayor of Magdeburg. Besides this, he constructed the first manometer and electrical machine. Even the princes occupied themselves much with such experiments, often, however, not so much from an interest in science as from their bent toward alchemy and similar cabalistic studies. But on the whole, Germany could not keep pace with Italy, France, the United Provinces, and England in their extraordinary advances in the sciences. German students in these branches had to seek instruction in foreign universities or from the writings of foreigners. Intellectual efforts found there neither the sympathy of large classes of the community, as in England, Italy, and Holland, nor the steadfast support of a powerful sovereign, as in France. Practical inventions were not encouraged and fostered by a wealthy and enterprising commercial class, so that the main incentive to making them was wanting. Nor were the consequences of the protracted war less disastrous to the religious life. The scant germs of improvement, which had shown themselves toward the end of the period immediately preceding it, were choked. In the Protestant lands, nothing prevailed but a lifeless adherence to the latter. In the Catholic, the Jesuits, with their rigid formalism and tyranny over the intellect, had all power in their hands, while the learned, as we have seen, were either pedants or sought stimulation in foreign lands. With delight, men gave themselves up to the seductive charm of France, particularly in the Protestant territories, which were more closely associated with their western neighbors. The German Calvinists maintained a lively intercourse with their French brethren, who, being discountenanced and sometimes even persecuted at home, settled in considerable numbers in the congenial German lands. The Catholic districts, on the other hand, found themselves once more in connection with Italy and Spain, and accepted their fashions, customs, and speech. French, Italian, and Spanish expressions made their way into the German language in such profusion that it was soon saturated with Latin elements. The result was that it lost much of its native character, and especially in the eagerly read newspapers became a confused medley of tongues. In vain did writers of the better sort bewail the evil, and satirists deride it. Even special societies were instituted for the maintenance of the purity of the language, but the intellectual poverty and want of literary endowments on the part of most of the members made it impossible for them to exercise any effective influence. That poetry kept itself pure from this confusion of tongues and other affectations was due chiefly to the fact that the national new high german poetry had its origin at this time under the auspices of so clear-sighted and patriotic a man as martin opitz this poet born in fifteen ninety seven at bunzlau in silesia was a man who had educated himself not only by a thorough study of the classics in the schools and universities but also by intercourse with highly gifted associates 
and a long sojourn in the free Netherlands. A journey to Paris also contributed to liberalise his mind and polish his taste. He early became famous and was crowned as poet laureate by Emperor Ferdinand II, Chosen to be secretary and court historiographer by the King of Poland, he died in 1639 of the plague. With justice he bears the name of Father of New High German Poetry. His earlier poems show a freshness and an originality of genius, which he later sacrificed too much to smoothness of form and a slavish imitation of foreign models. His didactic poems we admire chiefly for their occasional descriptions of nature and the power of observation they show. His tragedies, pastoral plays, and operas are long since forgotten, but they had a stimulating effect on his own and the immediately succeeding age. It is noteworthy that, at the same time with Opitz, an eminent Catholic author, Frederick von Spee, in the introduction to his book of songs, the Trutz Nachtigall, was contending for the essential principles of Opitz, especially for the avoidance of every foreign or even affected expression. More than Opitz, he shunned all leaning toward foreigners, and his songs, glowing with a fervid but mystical piety, show more true feeling and strike a more popular note than those of his cooler and more restrained contemporary. Himself a noble and lovable Jesuit father, he exhibits the beautiful and attractive side of the life of the Catholic orders. He was the first in Europe to protest in his book, Cautio Criminalis, 1631, against the atrocious persecution of witches, and he met with success. In accordance with the religious disposition of the time, the Protestant hymnology made itself rather more widely acceptable than the Catholic, and there is a most interesting development in that direction. John Herman, with his beautiful hymns, was a great comforter of poor and afflicted people. More profound, and yet more popular than Herman, was Paul Gerhardt. Never were the relations of the individual to his creator more fervently and more effectively depicted than in his sacred songs, several of which have become German classics. Secular poetry found a worthy representative in the greatest poet of the time, Paul Fleming. Born in 1609, in a parsonage among the mountains which separate Saxony from Bohemia, Fleming attained in his youth a position in the diplomatic service of the Duke of Schleswig-Holstein, and took part in an embassy to Moscow. He then studied medicine in Leipzig, and settled as a physician in Hamburg, where he died in 1640. Fleming came into personal contact with Opitz, and all his life regarded him as his master, but surpassed him in genuine feeling. How sincere and warm an interest he took in the sad faith of his countrymen, and how deeply he deplored their degeneracy, are shown in his lamentation over the quote unquote, changing and timidity of the present Germans. How keenly he felt for their literary fame in his poem Against the Contaminers of German Poetry. If Fleming was the greatest German poetical genius of his time, Andreas Griffius was the most versatile. Like Opitz, he was a Silesian, born in 1616, and like him, made several tours abroad. Alternately, a teacher and an executive officer of the respectable class, he died in his native city in 1664. A sad personal life and the afflictions of his fatherland have given a melancholy character to most of Griffius's creations. In contrast with Opitz, Griffius's lyrical pieces express his feelings with great truth and directness, but often with rudeness and in violation of the rules of poetical expression. His comedies are based on actual conditions and express the views of the people, but are often characterized by a rude comic power and unvarnished naturalness. Till Lessing, nothing so good as Griffius's comedies, appeared in this branch of literature. The popular bent that shows itself in Griffius's comedies is obvious also in the satirists. The Silesian, Frederick von Logau, is without doubt the leading epigrammatic poet of Germany. Power and pungency of expression, coupled with a light, airy grace, are finely and wittily united in him. As in the case of many patriotic writers of the period, a frequent subject for his scorn is the predominance of foreign, especially of French, influence.
Though poetry, thanks to the efforts of Opitz and Spee, had well maintained itself, prose had fallen to such a low level as to threaten the very existence of the language. But two prose authors kept it alive by avoiding the general bubble-like corruption, Moscherosch and Grimmelshausen. Moscherosch, an able Alsatian administrative officer and statesman, following the example of the Spanish Quevedo, lashed the errors and vices of his time in his wonderful and true visions of Philander of Zitewald. His wit, scathing as it is, always echoes the sorrows of his soul. His works were, unfortunately, too little adapted for the general public to become the common property of the whole nation, and this was also the case with the popular romances of Christopher von Grimmelshausen, especially his renowned Simplicissimus, the truest, most comprehensive, and at the same time the most captivating picture of contemporaneous conditions existing in German literature. To this day they are read with the same interest with which they were read two centuries ago, and probably with much more instruction. We do not hesitate to pronounce the adventuresome Simplicissimus, the greatest and most enduring production of the German intellect in the 17th century. Art during the period of storm and stress perished utterly. Every condition essential to its existence was lacking, security, wealth, national aspirations, and common traditions. And this at a period when, in the Netherlands, painting had developed on so magnificent a scale, and so distinctively, that Brabant and Holland almost took their place by the side of Italy. The Brabant school recognized as its founder and greatest master, Peter Paul Rubens, 1577 to 1640. This illustrious and many-sided genius had freed himself from the fetters of the mannerists that were predominant at home by a personal study of the great Italian artists of the 15th century and especially of the Venetians. The Venetian gorgeousness of coloring and skill in drawing are employed by him to express exuberant strength and joy of life. Delicate natures may be repelled by an occasional obtrusive sensuousness but his matchless massing of figures and his masterly drawing are overpowering. His works are the most beautiful embodiment of the nature of the low countries, with all its excellencies as well as its defects. Ecclesiastical and profane history, animals and portraits, children and landscapes, all formed subjects for his pencil and brush. Rubens's greatest disciple, Antony van Dyck, was of an entirely different nature. He had nothing of the master's superabundance of power, nor of his glowing genius, but was refined, sensitive, and without great inward force or self-reliance. At first he was a close imitator of Rubens. Then, on his visit to Italy, the Venetian masters had such an influence upon him that his productions are scarcely to be distinguished from theirs. Finally, as court painter to Charles I of England, he exhibits, in his portraits of the aristocratic court circle, wonderful delicacy of conception, touch, and color. In descriptive pictures, he shows a preference for subjects from the New Testament, which he treated with great feeling. No one among the great Brabant painters gives less expression to the sturdy character of the low countries than this delineator of the English nobility. To the brilliancy and richness of coloring and the aristocratic joy in pomp and splendor of the Brabant school, the masters of homely Republican Holland were strangers. But in common with it, they had a keen feeling for what is real. They identified themselves affectionately with nature. They possessed a faculty for vigorous execution and accurate study of details. In these Protestant lands, which broke with church traditions, Art began with simple portraiture and landscapes. In these two branches, van der Helst and especially Frank Hals distinguished themselves by likenesses characterized by breadth and boldness of touch. Franz Snyders, with power and talent, depicts hunting and battle scenes. John van Hoyen founded, in a simple and pleasing way, the landscape school where the favorite scenes are the wide-spreading, well-watered plains of his fatherland, in these subjects he was followed by his scholars. And then came the master, Rembrandt van Rijn, 1607-1669, who combined in himself all the tendencies of his predecessors, 
and carried them higher and farther. Rembrandt began by slavishly copying his models, without advancing from them to nobler and more beautiful forms. But his genius soon asserted itself, and while he always took nature as his teacher, he strove to idealize her and to bring out the living principle concealed in her. Wonderful are his light effects, sometimes clear and dazzling, sometimes in soft chiaroscuro. The great painter knew how to inspire even the most trifling objects with life. Like Rubens, he was many-sided in the subjects of his art, but he had no taste for mythology and treated it only from a coarse, comic point of view. Rembrandt belonged to that class of geniuses who are so supremely original that they leave no disciples. But the Dutch school continued to develop independently, particularly in landscape painting. In this the tone was given by Jacob Ruisdael, 1625-1682, an artist of the first rank. Nature worked on his spirit with a deep and often passionate effect, and yet his creations show a subtle knowledge of the laws of perspective and correct and delicate drawing. A spirit of melancholy seems to pervade the unique creations of this great painter-poet who writes elegies upon canvas. A pure creation of the Netherlands is the modern school of genre painting, which has never been equalled either in freshness and originality of conception or in delicacy of execution. The founder of this school was Peter Breuchel, who lived at the end of the 16th century. In the hands of the younger Breuchel and the elder David Teniers, it threatened to take a fantastic and extravagant turn, often verging on the absurd. The younger David Tenier, 1610-1690, restored it to its proper domain. He is indeed the true creator of the low-life genre painting of the Dutch school. He elevates the most vulgar subjects by his fine sense of humor, his masterly coloring, and dexterous light effects, and infuses a spirit of poetry into the most ordinary events of everyday life. Herard Terburg, 1608-1681, was the gifted painter of the life of the higher classes, whom he shows in all their splendor and dignity, the stately, richly bedecked gentlemen and the dames rustling in wide silken robes and flushing with costly jewelry. Terburg, the first of this school, was also the best. Next to him ranks the somewhat younger Herard Dau, and the two were the predecessors of a long series of workers in the same field. What a wonderful race was this little people of the Netherlands! The same generation that produced numerous painters of the first and second rank brought Dutch literature to its highest stage of perfection, a stage never again to be reached. Amsterdam was at this time the literary centre, where Hoft, Vondel, and Huygens worked together. Peter Hoft, 1581-1647, a scion of an illustrious patrician family, had cultivated his taste by many long foreign tours. His object was to combine the charm of Italian expression with the northern richness of thought. Thus he was the father of Dutch prose and poetry. It must, however, be acknowledged that in the latter field he showed less originality than he did as historian of his country. Joost van den Vondel, 1587-1679, justly enjoys the fame of being the first lyric poet of Holland, while as a dramatist he became a mere imitator of French models. Finally, Constantine Huygens, father of the renewed physicist, distinguished himself as an historian, but his poems have sunk into oblivion. More popular was Jakob Katz, 1577-1660, a Zeelander who plays an important part in the public affairs of the United Netherlands. His writings, spoken of as The Book of Father Katz, held their place, along with the Bible, for centuries in the Dutch and Flemish homes. Holland's renown for classical philology was maintained by such men as Hensius, Hugo Grotius, Rutgers, and Vossius. This country was, indeed, at that time, regarded as the true fatherland of learning. Mercius founded the study of Greek antiquities, Erpenius of Gorkum, and Holius raised the study of Arabic to the rank of science. On the original and suggestive discoveries of Kepler in regard to the eye, the Dutch based others of a practical nature. 
Jens Lippershey, a spectacle-maker of Middleburg, devised the telescope in 1608. Cornelius van Drebel, the microscope. About 1620, Villebroard Snail discovered the law of the refraction of light. The great jurist, Hugo Hrotius, Hugo de Hrot, the father of international law, was born at Delft in 1583. As a child, he attracted the notice of his country and of foreign potentates, and at the age of fifteen received a golden chain from Henry IV of France. His sympathy for the Armenians brought him into prison, but his self-sacrificing wife was successful in bringing about his escape. He fled first to France, then to Sweden, whence he weighed as Swedish ambassador to Paris. On his return toward Sweden, he was overtaken by death at Rostock in 1645. He was a many-sided man, thoroughly versed in classical lore. His literary labors were by no means confined to jurisprudence. He composed also theological, historical, and philosophical treatises, as well as poetry. His book, De Veritate Religionis Christiane, concerning the truth of the Christian religion, is regarded as the best of the later defenses of Christianity. But his greatest work, and that by which he has won undying fame, is his Three Books Concerning the Law of War and Peace, De Jure Belli et Pazis Libri Tres, 1625. This great work marked a new epoch in international relations, one might say in politics, because it sets forth for the first time the system of international law. It is characterized not only by a truly philosophical spirit and a humanity rarely found in those days, but also by the strictest scientific treatment, absolute freedom from party spirit, and a dignified and judicial calmness elevated above all the influences of the time. It at once claimed and received the most marked attention, and even today it is by no means obsolete. The life of Holland in the 17th century, civic, religious, and artistic, was sound and vigorous, and in melancholy contrast to that of the kindred race in Germany during and after the Thirty Years' War. Spain, also the adversary of Holland, was in a state of rapid and constant decay. As early as the beginning of the reign of Philip IV, a member of the Cortes had presented a memorial to him which summarized the sad condition of the country as follows, quote, Many places are depopulated and forsaken, the churches dilapidated, the houses in ruins, estates lost, the fields uncultivated, the inhabitants, with wives and children, on the highways, wandering from place to place in search of work, nourishing themselves with the grasses and roots of the fields. Others immigrate to lands where the subjects are not crushed down by taxes. End quote. The well-meant attempts at reform by the Count Duke Olivares were effectually frustrated by the many constant wars, which the king believed himself compelled to undertake for the maintenance of religion and the glory of the quote unquote, illustrious house of Austria. Herein the nation and the nobles were of the one mind with their ruler. They still looked upon Spain as the first country of the world. Wars were waged in Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Catalonia, Hungary, Bohemia, Poland, and Franche Comte. The burdens of war were all the more intolerable in that, since the expulsion of the Moors, industry and commerce had been half paralyzed. Furthermore, trade with all the lands with which Spain was at war, that is, with half of Europe, was forbidden for her people. At the same time, the wars emptied the public coffers and necessitated continual loans. The revenue, which in 1634 amounted to 18 million ducats, of which only 7 million had to be expended to pay the interest on the national debt, was now almost entirely swallowed up in paying the interest on and redeeming the national loans. If Olivares, to raise money, suddenly doubled the nominal value of the metallic currency, or to make handiwork cheaper, made the sale of grain compulsory at prices fixed by authority, his measures only increased the evil. As the land became poorer, the imposts rose higher, for the war swallowed incredible sums. Already Olivares, in despair at the drying up of the regular sources of revenue, had appealed to the magnanimity of private persons. While the minister was scarcely able to bear up longer under the burden of affairs, the king's mind was occupied with amusements of all sorts. 
festivals, ballets, bullfights, theatrical performances. The authority of the Cortes, like that of the monarch, was only nominal, for Philip always signed whatever Olivares laid before him. One thing is certain, the minister thought only of the real good of the state, and neither enriched himself nor allowed those around him to enrich themselves. With a firm hand he held the grandees in check, and permitted them neither to plunder nor defraud the country. On the other hand, they were free to indulge in enjoyments of all kinds, for which the king set the example. Sexual immorality was almost universal in Spain. From it resulted brawls, abductions, and assassinations without number. In Madrid alone, 110 murders occurred within one week. For two decades Olivares maintained himself as uncontrolled master of Spain. Then, when his overstrained system of rule broke down, when Portugal and Catalonia rose in revolt, when France was winning victory after victory in the Netherlands and in Italy, and when state bankruptcy became inevitable, the blame for all these misfortunes was heaped on his head. The queen, Isabella of Bourbon, whose private life was not above suspicion, placed herself at the head of the enemies of Olivares, and at length, in January 1633, just a month after Richelieu's death, prevailed upon the weak and irresolute monarch to banish his favorite to his estates. The joy at Olivares's overthrow was universal. A placard was found attached to the gate of the royal palace saying, quote, Now thou wilt be Philip the Great indeed, for the Count Duke will no longer make thee little. End quote. The short-sighted multitude always believes that a change will bring a better state of affairs. It was probably fortunate for Olivares that, a year and a half later, death removed him beyond the power of his enemies. His best vindication is that matters became worse in Spain after his fall. At first the king, to the joy of his loyal subjects, declared his purpose of conducting the government himself. But as he had little success, and, through the death of his queen and of the heir apparent, Balthazar Charles, was left without family life, he fell back into his former wasteful and dissolute habits. His increasing sickliness, aggravated, as in the case of most of the members of the House of Austria, by immoderate eating, decided him to give up the conduct of public affairs and entrust them to Don Luis de Aro, a well-meaning but only moderately gifted minister. Friendly and complacent to everyone, he was, above all, a man of peace but in spite of his good will, he had little practical ability and was little acquainted with foreign affairs. In the deplorable condition of Spain, even a great genius could scarcely have changed matters for the better. A navy was no longer maintained, for it would have become merely a spoil for her enemies. Her merchant marine, on account of the prohibition of intercourse with England, France, Venice and Portugal, had practically ceased to exist. The incessant changes in the value of money, the wretched condition of the highways, and the exorbitant taxes destroyed whatever was left of the domestic trade of Spain. Her moral degeneration more than kept pace with her material decadence. All was corrupt, from the minister and viceroy down to the village bailiff, and from the general to the sergeant. No wonder that the unpaid soldiery renounced their service, that every man regarded the state that made such inordinate demands as his enemy, for which he ought to do nothing voluntarily, but which he was justified in defrauding to the utmost of his ability. Literature and art alone were not affected by the general spirit of decay. One of the favorite amusements of the court was dramatic representations, in which the queen herself and the princesses took part. Indeed, the dramatic instinct was deep-rooted among the people. In the beginning of the 17th century, Lope de Vega stood on the pinnacle of his fame, but was shortly displaced by Pedro Calderón de la Barca, 1600 to 1681. Calderón wrote comedies, dramas, tragedies, and sacred plays, autos, all with the same richness of thought, fertility of imagination, and ease of versification. Calderón's forte does not lie in subtle delineation of individual character, but he knows how to let the voice of nature speak out clear and true, even in its deepest, most exciting, and most affecting tones. The Spain of his time, especially that of the higher orders, with their sensitive feeling of honor, their reckless courage, their pomp of speech, 
their love for gallant adventures, and their unbounded devotion to the churches, lives, acts, and speaks before us in the works of this poet. But there was not only dramatic poetry. The brothers Argensola were eminently happy in their imitations of Horace, showing taste, clearness, and a feeling for pictorial beauty. Quevedo wrote his satirical visions and comic romances such as The History and Life of the Great Sharper. Vieja's love songs are not destitute of charm, but they are marred by exaggerated and forced expressions and figures. Luis de Gongora sedulously developed this far-fetched, affected manner, the cultivated style, and thus became the founder of a formal school known as Gongorists. No word preserved its natural sense, no sentence its natural structure, no thought received natural expression. All was novel, inverted, forced into unusual forms, mixed up with foreign-like elements, and embellished with monstrous metaphors. Thus the inauguration of the rapid decadence of Spanish literature falls immediately after the period of its proudest bloom, in the time of Philip IV, who himself took a lively interest in the poetry of the quote-unquote culturists. The king interested himself also in painting, and was a frequent visitor in the studios of the great artists who then raised Spanish painting to its height. Their art was characterized by an ardent religious feeling. Full surrender of self to the divine, monkish ascetism, consuming zeal for the faith, such are the favorite subjects of the Spanish artists, whose work is marked by strong coloring and skill in gradation of shades. They stand upon the shoulders of the Venetians, whose types they modify in a way to make them national. De las Roelas and Francisco Herrera were the first to implant these tendencies in the school of Seville. Francisco Surbaran, 1592-1662, the first to give them full expression. From the same school came Diego Velázquez de Silva, 1599-1660, to a Sevillan, though his exact study of the Netherlanders and his long sojourn in Italy enabled him to break the bonds in which his fellow artists lay, and gave him a wider range. The silvery, airy colouring, peculiar to him, diffuses a charm of sentiment over his pictures. Landscapes, genre pieces, as well as religious subjects, occupied his brush, till his career was ultimately determined by Philip IV, appointing him his court painter. After this, he devoted himself to painting the portraits of persons of eminence, and this work, in his hands, acquired a more dignified, imposing, and noble character than in those of the Netherlanders. In colouring, Velázquez combined the excellencies of the Venetian and Netherland schools. He and Murillo, who was born two decades later, constitute the most brilliant double star in the artistic firmament of Spain. Sculpture, too, was transplanted to Spain by the admirable Berruguete in the first half of the 16th century, and found there, especially in the south, a race of zealous devotees, reaching down to the present day. The chief names are those of Montañez, died 1649, an artist of the first rank, and his more famous pupil, Alonso Cano of Granada, 1601-1667, who, like Michelangelo, was sculptor, architect, and painter, having studied painting in Seville. Philip IV brought him, while still a young man, to court, appointing him superintendent of the royal edifices and court painter. He was especially eminent as a carver of captivatingly beautiful statuettes in painted wood. Thus literature and art gilded the waning greatness of Spain, and lent to its death throes something grand and attractive. Spanish science had long since died in the stifling embrace of the Inquisition. End of part one of Europe in the Middle of the Seventeenth Century by Martin Philipson Part 2 of Europe in the Middle of the 17th Century by Martin Philipson From the History of All Nations from Earliest Times, Volume 13, The Age of Louis XIV Translated under the supervision of John Henry Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Piotr Natter Italy was, in many respects, in political dependence on Spain. 
and yet the two countries were very different from each other in their intellectual and social development the victory of the exclusive and persecuting party in the catholic church had indeed impeded the intellectual advance of italy but had not fully checked it for this the country was mainly indebted to the growing mildness of disposition especially among the better orders which imperceptibly removed their weapons from the hands of the inquisitors after a moment of grim and bloody reaction the whole nation even the priesthood gave itself up too completely to the soft charms of art and poetry to think any longer of heresy hunts and autos da fe the fact too that the petty tyrants gradually disappeared and made room for an ampler national life in which truer ideas of statesmanship were comprehended and realized contributed still further to humanize popular manners though criticism of religion and the state was severely punished intellectual and spiritual development was not systematically restricted as in spain but was instead fostered under the sure but mild guardianship of laws impartially dispensed and observed by absolute but not despotic rulers the whole people even the very poorest and most ignorant were carried away with enthusiasm over the productions of the great poets and artists of the sixteenth century and promised their successors honor and wealth when the dread of a great franco-spanish war vanished on the death of henry the fourth of france and the peace-loving philip the third ruled in spain a period of quiet and happy development seemed to dawn for italy even the spanish administration in naples under lemos and osuna encouraged study the university of that city enlarged and improved by accession of professors from all the rest of italy once more acquired an authoritative place in the domain of learning the hope of such a period of peaceful prosperity was not fully realized the restless ambitions of charles emmanuel of savoy the long protracted valtellina affair and later the war for the mantuan succession disturbed the repose of north italy but central and lower italy enjoyed nearly a half century of peace which was rarely broken the only person who occasionally interrupted this condition was urban the eighth who seemed to desire to revive the papal policy of the first half of the sixteenth century he combated the german and spanish habsburgs though they were the champions of catholicism against heresy an open rapture occurred on this point in the college of cardinals and amid the applause of the gathering a borgia was bold enough to charge the pope with religious indifference a charge echoed by the outer world his nepotism too was notorious many balls of his predecessors forbade the endowment of relatives of the pope with principalities and other high offices at the cost of the church nevertheless the barberini were now laden with such dignities and with unmeasured wealth with their greatly swollen revenues the relatives of urban the eighth were able to purchase the ancient fiefs of the colonna orsini sforza and other illustrious families with a view to prolonging the influence of his kin beyond his own life urban conferred on them forty-two cardinalates finally that nothing might be wanting to recall conditions so little in accord with the age urban the eighth like an alexander the sixth or a julius the second again took up the plan of conquering the world of all the principalities that had been carved out of the states of the church every one had been reabsorbed save only urbino of which the della rovere the family of julius the second were rulers their sway was mild and favourable to art here raphael had been born and received his initiation into art bembo had taken up his abode here and on the little umbrian state there still lingered as it were the afterglow of the sixteenth century duke francis maria the second now old and childless could no longer offer effectual resistance to urban when he demanded the admission of papal troops into his fortresses when the prince died in sixteen thirty one the church forthwith took possession of the land much to the sorrow of its inhabitants this success emboldened urban to proceed with open violence against another family which owed its position to papal nepotism the farnese this race descended from pope paul the third ruled over not a papal but an imperial fief namely parma duke odoardo a coarse passionate and unpopular man held also the duchy of castro in the states of the church 
The Barberini craved it, while the Pope hoped to unite Parma and Piacenza with the states of the Church. Under entirely frivolous pretexts, his soldiers in 1641 occupied Castro, and in 1642 Urban put the Duke under the ban of the Church. But Odoardo Farnese found support in the other Italian princes, who for a long time had been incensed over the grasping policy of the Holy See. There was scarcely a state that Urban had not, in his arrogance, insulted, but a short time before he had laid the senators of the peaceful little republic of Lucca under excommunication, because it had dared to punish with imprisonment the robber brother of a cardinal. The republic had turned for protection to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. This prince, Cosmo II, was resolved to endure no further act of violence on the part of the pontiff, and organized an alliance for the protection of the Farnese, of which the Este of Modena, as well as Venice, were members. War broke out between these secular powers and the head of the church. Urban VIII, however, in the spring of 1644, was ready to sign a disadvantageous peace, which set Odoardo free from excommunication and replaced him in Castro. This humiliating defeat showed the weakness of the power of the Pope, who soon afterward, in July 1644, died. The situation was but little improved. Under his successor, Innocent X, the Barberini, notwithstanding the number of their creatures, were unable to procure the choice of one of their own family by the conclave, and had therefore consented to the election of Giovanni Battista Pamphili, which, from the slight importance of his family, and from his age, seventy-two years, seemed to imply no menace. But the family of the new pope, precisely on the account of their lowly condition, were determined to enrich themselves as quickly as possible, and this could best be effected at the cost of the universally hated Barberini, who therefore had to leave Rome, their offices, palaces, and wealth, as a prey to the new house. As they had favored France, the new government took the side of Spain, and a complete change of policy was the consequence. A reconciliation was effected with the Italian states, especially with Venice and the Medici, but the internal misrule remained unchanged. Personally, Innocent X was honorable, well-meaning, and industrious, and earnestly sought to restore order and justice in his dominions, but he was weak with age, and so completely subservient to his relatives, that nepotism under him was as scandalous as under his predecessor. Only one ray of fortune gilded his rule. Odoardo Farnese so misused his success in regard to Castro, and made himself so universally hated, that Innocent was able to take forcible possession of the contested fief without the new duke, Ranuncio II, finding any support in the other Italian princes. Otherwise, the grey-haired pontiff was so afflicted and perpetually irritated by the turmoils and unseemly dealings of his family as to become a burden both to himself and to others. Innocent died in 1655, to his own relief, and that of all the world. Under such popes the high office conferred little authority, whether ecclesiastical or political. The great religious wars had been decided without the cooperation of the popes, nay, almost contrary to their wishes. The papal administration was wretched, Debts were so enormous that the interest upon them swallowed up the whole income of the papal states, so that the cost of the court, the executive, and the army had to be met by the Pope's ecclesiastical income and constant new loans. The nobles, once warlike and fired with the spirit of enterprise, were now utterly effeminate and cared only for pomp, titles, magnificent palaces, and multitudes of idle servants. Such extravagances had lessened power and multiplied debts. The old medieval families were thrust more and more into the background before the papal families of plebeian origin, the Borghese, Chigi, Pamphili, and Barberini. These led a brilliant life in the capital, constituted a formal court, set the fashion for Rome, and exercised the most important influence in the election of new popes. The government of the church was, in consequence, more uniform, milder, weaker, and more inclined to peace. Of the other Italian states, Tuscany, in its peaceful and uneventful quietude, comes scarcely at all into notice, Genoa but little, Venice somewhat more, Savoy most of all. The Republic of Genoa 
had, through the reform measures of 1575 and 1576, acquired a degree of freedom such as was scarcely to be found elsewhere in Europe. The privileged classes had become so comprehensive as to include every well-to-do citizen. The power of the different magistracies was accurately defined. Personal freedom and liberty of speech were practically unlimited. But the Genoese government seemed to have abrogated tyranny and exclusive privileges only to fall into lethargy and weakness. A revolt of the Popolani, the democracy, was planned in 1628 with the connivance of and with promises of help from Duke Charles Emmanuel of Savoy, their aim being the murder of the Senate and nobles and the establishment of a thoroughly democratic regime. But the conspiracy was discovered shortly before the contemplated outbreak and punished by the execution of the ringleaders. One can still see, running in a wide curve along the heights which enclose the city, the powerful forts then erected for the defense against the Savoyard. Shortly afterward, peace was restored, and for half a century, Genoa was at liberty to engage in commerce and financial transactions in perfect peace. Venice had so far as possible maintained its policy of peace, but was always opposed to its three ancient adversaries, the Church, the House of Habsburg, and the Turks. The papacy, by repeated illegal demands, caused constant friction with the Venetian authorities. The chief sensation was caused by the murderous assaults made on Fra Paolo Sarpi, the undaunted Servite monk, who had fearlessly come forward as the champion of national independence against papal aggrandizement, and had been the ecclesiastical counsellor of the Senate in its strifes in the years 1606 and 1607. In October 1607, the daggers of the assassins actually struck him, but he did not receive a mortal wound. As the assassins escaped to the states of the church, and there went about, not only unmolested, but boasting of their deed, people agreed with Sarpi himself in thinking that this was perpetrated still Romane Curie, with the stylus, dagger, of the Roman Curia. The Venetian Senate protected and honored its theologian after his recovery a course of action which again gave great offence in Rome. Sarpi died in 1623. Venice seemed to be still more seriously threatened by the machinations of Spain. The House of Habsburg had good ground for being displeased with the Republic, which had for years carried on war with the rulers of Austria on account of the frontier district, Friuli. It had besides made it possible, through subsidies, for the Duke of Savoy to defend himself against the assaults of Spain in 1616 and 1617. In September of the latter year, a general peace had been concluded. A Spanish dignitary soon appeared, however, who endeavoured to nullify the effects of the treaty. This was Duke of Osuna, Viceroy of Naples, who was assured of the protection of the then all-powerful Minister Uceda. He maintained, at the expense of the poor Neapolitans, a considerable force, and built in hot haste a large fleet. From all sides Venice had warning that Osuna had designs upon her. One of Osuna's officials had repeatedly exclaimed, quote, This year the Venetians will receive the finest drubbing. End quote. At length Osuna sent a number of warships under his own flag into the Adriatic, a sea that the Venetians had been wont to regard as a part of their dominions. It was maintained that he would have landed troops in the city had not the premature disclosure of his plan prevented its accomplishment. Meanwhile, a pirate from Normandy, by the name of Jacob Pierre, had gone over from the Neapolitan service to the Venetian, and had, by pretending to reveal Osuna's secret plans, endeavoured to secure an important position for himself but he was suspected of being in collusion with Osuna, and his communication was regarded as designed to deceive the signori. The suspicion was well founded, for Pierre had recruited numerous mercenaries who were to rise as soon as the fleet appeared at the mouth of the lagoon. The whole scheme was completely foiled. First, Osuna's fleet, which attacked the Venetian fleet in time of peace, was utterly defeated near Santa Croce. Then some of the parties to the plot disclosed it to the Venetian authorities. The ringleaders were arrested, May 1618, whereupon hundreds of their accomplices fled to Naples. The Spanish government desired to disavow Osuna's schemes, now that they had failed, and he was recalled. Deeply moved at seeing his hopes thus shattered, 
the Duke resolved on resistance and on making himself independent in Naples. With a view to gaining support, he attempted in 1620 to form an alliance with the Republic whose ruin he had vowed. Venice would have nothing to do with his intrigues, and Osuna, deserted by his soldiers, had to take ship for Spain, where he was cast into prison and where he died four years later. In Venice no one believed in the non-complicity of Spain, and the Republic opposed both the Spaniards and the Emperor in the Mantuan War of Succession in 1628, but very ineffectively. Gustavus Adolphus received from her a subsidy against the Emperor, but in the following Franco-Spanish contest she deemed it more prudent to maintain a discreet neutrality. The circumstances prompted this policy. First, the Turkish War, next the ever-increasing disintegration in the Venetian state. The reciprocal plunderings and conflicts of the ships of the Barbary powers on the one hand, and those of Malta and Leghorn on the other, were constantly producing complications from which Venice, on account of her possessions and garrisons in Crete and the archipelago, could not keep herself free. In the spring of 1645, over 50,000 Turks landed in Crete and began the conquest of the rich islands. The fleets which the Italian states sent to its relief showed themselves as unwarlike and cowardly as the Italian armies of the period. The mercenaries of the Republic, on the other hand, mostly Germans and French, fought with determined courage and delayed for twenty-two years the surrender of the besieged capital, Candia. The long and embittered struggle scarcely did more to weaken the Republic than the corruption which ate deeper and deeper into its heart. Failing means, with growing luxury, increasing effeminacy, and the spread of unmanly and unpatriotic sentiments combined to introduce a spirit of venality, treachery, and mistrust among the leading nobles themselves, which threatened the very existence of the state founded on this aristocracy. Elections were now determined not by merit but by bribery, so that the public offices fell more and more exclusively into the hands of a few rich families. Several of the highest officials of the state were convicted of participation in Osuna's plot, and executed or sent to prolonged imprisonment. Besides well-grounded accusations, denunciations of innocent people from hate or avidity were frequent and often led to their unjust condemnation. Under these conditions, the prestige of the Republic necessarily waned, and its administration became more and more corrupt. The most famous among these false accusations was that which caused the death of Antonio Foscarini. This man, descended from one of the most respected patrician families of the city, after completing an excellent course of study, served his country in several important offices. While ambassador to England, he fell into strife with his secretary, Muscorno, a vain, ambitious man who wished to be ambassador himself. Since Vascarini would not give way to him, Muscorno went to Venice and accused the ambassador of dishonorable and treacherous conduct. Foscarini was recalled, put to trial, but after three years was acquitted. His calumniator was condemned to two years' confinement in a fortress. Foscarini seemed fully cleared of suspicion. He became a senator and was again entrusted with important political negotiations. But scarcely was Muscorno at liberty when, with a hatred quickened by the thirst of revenge, he began again to labor for the ruin of his enemy, and this time with success. He made use of Foscarini's intimate relations with an English woman of high rank, the Countess of Arundel, whose house was a rendezvous for diplomatists, to accuse him of entering into traitorous correspondence with foreign powers through intermediaries. Since Foscarini would not acknowledge any intimate relations with the Countess, he would not satisfactorily account for his frequent secret visits to her house, and he was condemned and hanged. Four months later, his innocence was proved. His main accuser, a certain Vano, with one of his accomplices, suffered death, and the memory of Foscarini was, with much formal ceremony, pronounced unsullied. This melancholy event diminished the prestige of the ruling families and made evident the necessity of radical reforms. But when it came to the inauguration of real reforms, and more particularly to the limitation of the power of the Council of Ten, the influence of the great families was ultimately strong enough to frustrate any attempts at a change for the better. 
Discontent and a spirit of rebellion were the unavoidable consequences. Much sadder was the fate of Savoy, torn by internal and by foreign war. Under Charles Emmanuel I, this duchy had played an important part, and just for this reason both france and spain were eager to make themselves masters of the land that commanded the alpine passes between france and italy with this aim they availed themselves of the strife over the regency which broke out in sixteen thirty seven on the death of charles emmanuel's son and successor victor amadeus i who had left only a minor son according to the duke's will the regency was to be conducted by his widow christine sister of louis the thirteenth but as she a foreigner and a frenchwoman was unpopular her brother-in-law cardinal maurice and prince thomas sought to exclude her from the government if the princess held the office richelieu would be master of savoy and piemont if however the two princes both of whom were in spanish pay obtained it olivares would gain these provinces for his country prince thomas with spanish help took possession of the capital turin the cardinal occupied the country of nice while christine along with the young duke charles emmanuel the second held court in chambery christine then went to grenoble to meet louis and richelieu and entreat them for help they sent count arcou to piemont meanwhile leganes the spanish governor of milan entered the unfortunate land and wasted and plundered it sixteen thirty eight arcour defeated his enemy at casale and undertook the siege of turin whose inhabitants bitterly hated the french and defended themselves gallantly at length leganes came to their aid but all his attempts to storm arcourt's camp failed famine finally compelled the surrender of the city after a memorable defence of sixteen months september sixteen forty christine returned to turin where the french at once inaugurated a reign of terror for all their adversaries Meanwhile, the war continued for several years, and with great injury to the country. The two princes saw this with sorrow, and were forced to recognize that Savoy was treated only as a tool by the rival contestants, whose sole aim was their own interests. In 1642, therefore, they submitted to their sister-in-law, who granted them their positions as governors, as well as a certain degree of cooperation in public affairs the spaniards were driven from one after another of the fortresses which they held in piemont the land was left in the most wretched condition and what its people felt most keenly of all in complete dependence on france thus did italy become more and more the battlefield and the spoil of the habsburgs and bourbons the political and military decadence of italy in the first half of the seventeenth century was reflected in its literature the authors of this period are far from possessing the power and dignity of their predecessors. Their type was a Neapolitan, Giovanni Battista Marini, 1569-1622. Only a few years before his death, he published his great work, Adonis, a needlessly long amatory poem of 45,000 verses. As the subject matter is effeminate, so the treatment is characterized by a mawkish sweetness and a straining after effect by means of florid hyperbole and overstrained imagery that in spite of the beauty of isolated passages make it intolerable to the modern reader marinism had been charged with being the cause of similar sins in non-italian authors but without foundation the degeneracy and departure from nature characteristic of the seventeenth century everywhere produced the same results in foreign lands as in italy among his compatriots marini's poetry met with enthusiastic acceptance as evidence of how exactly it was in harmony with the tastes of the time the old heroic poems the poetical romances of chivalry on the other hand had lost favour with the public this perversion of taste alessandro tassoni lashes with pungent satire in his rape of the bucket a comic epic of inexhaustible and unoffensive wit he gives us a caricature of the wars that the italian states so often carried on with one another furnishing as it were a prototype of the war of castro gabriel cabrera of savona fifteen fifty two to sixteen thirty seven belongs both in point of time and in the bent of his genius to the sixteenth century a profound scholar and an ardent admirer of the antique 
he knew how to transform the old in accordance with modern Italian ideas. He shows to best advantage in his lyrics, in which he frees himself from the hitherto exclusively dominant Petrarchian type, and is, in a truly original manner, both novel and sublime. In boldness of imaginative power, in lofty flights of genius, in freedom and diversity of form, he has had no equal in his native land until the nineteenth century. But he had no imitators in his own age. The fashion favoured Marini. The style of elegant prose literature was equally affected by the depraved taste of the times. It would indeed be difficult to name here a single original book of permanent value. Letters, however, on the most varied political, social, and intellectual questions were then much in favor, and the collections of those of Cardinal Bentivoglio, a distinguished statesman and historian, and of the renowned Galileo, are worthy of mention. Boccalini's satire, Miscellanies from Parnassus, is a racy booklet that in its day enjoyed great popularity. Highly characteristic of the humane but effeminate Italian of his epoch is his outburst against the military spirit and the usages of war. War, he says, is sometimes necessary, but it is yet a condition so inhuman and barbarous that there are no fine words that can make it tolerable. Boccalini was an enthusiastic republican and therefore lauds Venice, while he scourges with bitter irony the petty princely tyrants of his time. In his touchstone he develops his political sentiments still more trenchantly, and in doing so sheds a clear light on contemporaneous public opinion in Italy. He gives undisguised and wrathful expression to the hatred of all Italians for Spanish domination, for the court of the Catholic king, and for his subjects' arrogant lust for conquest and ascendancy. The Italy of our epoch boasts of two admirable historical works, Bentivoglio's History of the War in the Netherlands and Davila's Civil War in France. Both writers show the same sobriety of judgment and appropriate style and method that distinguished the great Italian historians of the 16th century. Both were intimately acquainted with the lands of which they wrote. Bentivoglio had resided, as papal nuncio, in Brussels and Paris. Davila had held important military and political posts in France and Venice. Passing from practical to theoretical politicians, we come to the name of Thomas Campanella. This philosophical Dominican monk, persecuted both by the Spanish government and the Inquisition, wrote a treatise on the state, which, along with much eulogy of the papal and French courts, contains many sound observation. His City of the Sun is a fantastic sort of political and social utopia, based in many parts on the Platonic model, but permeated with his own chimerical and mystical philosophy. Hunted incessantly by his numerous foes, this gifted monk died in 1639, in the retirement of the monastery. Much more practical than Campanella was Antonio Serra, whose work on the causes of wealth in gold and silver is a work of political economy of high value for the history of this science. It comprises a complete exposition of the so-called mercantile system, which later, through Colbert's example, prevailed throughout Europe for more than a century. This system lays the main stress on manufacturers and commerce, which it holds to be much more susceptible of development than agriculture, and which therefore ought to be fostered at the expense of the latter. Serra's book, 1613, had great influence on the economical and financial opinions of the day. His ideal was the state of Venice, wealthy because it was an exclusively commercial city, as contrasted with poor agricultural Naples. In the exact sciences, Italy contended for the foremost place with Germany, which could boast of her Copernicus and Kepler. Cavalieri, professor of mathematics in Bologna, carried the mathematical ideas suggested by the latter great scholar still farther, and through his work on the Geometry of the Indivisibles, 1635, became the father of modern geometry. By this method he attained much more precise determinations and measurements than had been possible before. Aldrovandi summed up the whole zoological knowledge of his time in comprehensive handbooks. Caspar Aselli, 
professor of anatomy in Pavia, discovered the lacteals of the mesentery that convey the chyle to the blood, and thus play an important part in the alimentation of the animal body. But the most eminent, most gifted, and most renowned figure in Italian science was Galileo Galilei. Born at Pisa in 1564, the son of an able mathematician, he studied medicine in his native city, but soon turned to mathematical and physical studies, seeking for these a firm and reliable foundation in mathematics. A remarkable faculty of observation, an acute judgment, and an intellect at once profound and clear united to qualify him for making his amazing discoveries the oscillations of a lamp suspended from the dome of the cathedral at pisa led to the discovery of the equal duration of the oscillations of a pendulum and with this he associated the most interesting investigations concerning the centre of gravity of bodies one of the first fruits of his labours was the invention of the hydrostatic balance by which he determined the specific gravity of bodies. His most important discoveries were made after he had exchanged the mathematical chair of Pisa for that of Padua. Here his contributions to science were the thermometer, a proportional compass or sector, and the refracting telescope for astronomical investigations, 1609. Imperfect as was Galileo's telescope, chiefly from the limited extent of its field, the great man was yet able to make the most astonishing observations with it. He recognized the inequalities on the moon's surface, and rightly attributed these to mountains. He even made approximate calculations of their height. Further, he resolved the Milky Way and certain other nebulae into multitudes of suns, massed in special points of the firmament. He detected four little stars in the neighborhood of Jupiter, and rightly determined them to be satellites of the great planet. These surprising discoveries he announced in a book which justly bore the title of Nuncius Siderus, the starry messenger. Men at this time took the liveliest interest in astronomy, partly because the theories and writings of Copernicus and Kepler had aroused their curiosity, but probably more because the science was so intimately associated with astrology. The Nuncius Siderus attracted universal attention, and the Grand Duke of Tuscany, by rewarding its author with the richly endowed sinecure of court mathematician, made it possible for Galileo to devote himself in Florence exclusively to his studies. His astronomical discoveries now followed in rapid succession, one of the principal being the earth-like character of the planets, as opposed to the solar nature of the fixed stars. Galileo's telescopic observations had fully convinced him of the absolute correctness of the Copernican theory of the universe. His advocacy of this brought the wrath of the Church upon his head, for it had denounced the Copernican system as heretical. Galileo offered to prove that this system was in perfect harmony with orthodoxy, but this attempt to compel the Church to submission in her own domain only served to embitter her more. Through personal exertions in Rome, Galileo had no difficulty in securing his own safety, but he could not prevent the index officers from stigmatizing Copernicus's doctrine as, quote, absurd and infidel, unquote, and placing his book, with several of Galileo's own treatises relative thereto, in the Index Prohibitorum. The philosopher submitted to the ecclesiastical dictum, but in his heart he rebelled against the judgment. When, seven years later, his friend and patron, Cardinal Barberini, ascended the papal throne as Urban VIII, he again ventured in a dialogue of the two chief systems of the universe on a comprehensive demonstration of the truth of the Copernican views. Scarcely was the work published, 1632, when the Jesuits persuaded the Pope that the astronomer had held him up to ridicule. Galileo had to appear before the Inquisition in 1633. In spite of the contemporaneous and subsequent falsifications in the records of the process, it is now proved that Galileo was really subjected to torture in accordance with the terms of sentence pronounced on him. The permission to print, formerly granted to him, was declared to have been obtained under false pretenses, and the philosopher, then in his seventieth year, was compelled on bended knee to abjure the Copernican doctrine. His dialogue was suppressed, and he himself was condemned to imprisonment for an indefinite time. 
His sentence was indeed commuted to enforced retirement at his own villa at Florence, and he never again regained full liberty. A victim to manifold bodily sufferings, he survived his trial eight years, and died in 1642. He had become blind, yet had occupied himself unremittingly with scientific work, and with the compilation and arrangement of the results of his earlier investigations. In Italy these could not be published, but this was accomplished abroad, especially in Germany. Like Italian poetry, architecture fell into decay. True beauty, nobility of form, and symmetry of proportions were sacrificed to violent and tasteless effects. The aim now was massiveness in proportions, extravagant richness of ornamentation, and pictorial perspective not at all in harmony with the essential nature of this art. Nothing kept its natural character. The straight lines of the walls were converted into advancing and retiring curves with bulky projections architraves were sinews the gables of open work without purpose the pillars unreasonably serpentine everywhere there was an ostentatious profusion of interlaced foliage fruit pieces figures shells and emblems of all kinds lorenzo bernini fifteen ninety eight to sixteen eighty is the most prominent representative of this baroque style his disciple and rival francesco boromini sought to surpass him through the exaggeration of tasteless ornamentation and a preposterous medley of all the constructive elements. His example was unfortunately too much followed north of the Alps. In the art of sculpture also Bernini was the despot of his age, and here too all canons of art and good taste were outraged. Extravagant emotions, sensual treatment of the nude, coarse strength in the male figures, coquettish attitudes in those of the females were too much in keeping with the effeminate life of the italy of his period a host of subordinate masters imitated his vicious example neither could italian painting remain entirely unaffected by the prevailing tendency but here this was by no means so incongruous as in the case of sculpture there were at this period highly gifted artists who knew how to elevate it from its eccentricities and how to purify and ennoble it. In the beginning of our epoch, the Carracci sought to bring painting back to the study of nature and of the great artists of the 16th century, and they attained the happiest results. But their disciples, Domenico Zampieri, commonly called Domenichino, and Guido Reni, were able to follow this tendency only in their earlier pictures, and soon began to prefer showy ornamentation and a somewhat excessive sweetness of expression. Carlo Dolci is the characteristic representative of this school. Yet these artists, among whom Francesco Barbieri, called Guercino, takes a high prize, knew how to lend a high and enduring value to their works, and to elevate them above the commonplace of mere sensuous effects, by the marvellous blending and power of their colours, by their sense for the beautiful, and by their truth of feeling. In politics, Italy and Spain retired more and more into the background to make room for the predominating influence of France. A great revolution, too, was preparing in the east of Europe, which was to elevate Russia at the expense of Poland and Turkey. On the destiny of Poland, the twenty-five years' reign of the fanatical disciple of Jesuitism, Sigismund III, exercised the most baneful influence. In this time all the germs of corruption were developed, which the predominance of a selfish petty nobility and the brutal violence of the counter-reformation had introduced into the state. For a time, indeed, the valour of her nobles and her abundant population maintained the prestige of Poland abroad. Her intervention in Russian affairs gained for her, at the peace of Devulino, 1618, Smolensk, Severa, and Chernigov, important provinces which introduced her sway into the very heart of Russia. But this success was much more than counterbalanced by the rise of a powerful and popular dynasty in Russia, endowed with all the freshness and vigor of youth. The decline of the welfare of the Polish people became more and more rapid. Wild revolts of the refractory nobles shook the fabric of the state. The great rebellion of the voivode Nicholas Zebrzydowski, notwithstanding occasional successes of the royal troops, was brought to an end only by inglorious concessions on the part of the crown. 
A war with Turkey, provoked by a contest over the election of a prince in Moldavia, ended with the Peace of Hotin in 1621, which conceded to the Turks this fortress, commanding the most important passage of the Dniester, as well as the sole right of nominating the Moldavian princes. Scarcely was this war closed when Sigismund involved himself in the great German religious war by taking the side of Catholicism and Austria. This act he expiated by the cession to Gustavus Adolphus of a part of Prussia and of Livonia. After Sigismund's death, although no rival appeared to contest the crown with his son Władysław, it pleased the nobility to institute an interregnum for six months, during which the turbulent elements were free to indulge, unchecked, in violence, plundering, and personal feuds. Finally, Władysław IV was elected, a man by no means wanting in courage and military ability. When the Russian Tsar, Michael Romanov, attempted to take advantage of the change in Polish rulers to recover the provinces which he had lost by the peace of the Volino, Władysław completely hemmed in his army and forced it to capitulate. A peace concluded at Wiasma confirmed Poland in her possession. Furthermore, the peace of Stumsdorf with Sweden, 1635, gave back to the king, if not Livonia, at least that portion of Prussia lost by his father. But the process of internal decay had made rapid strides from two causes, the predominance of the clergy and the growing usurpations of the nobility. Władysław was an obedient disciple of the church. The Jesuits had already the higher education in their hands. The king made over to them the middle and lower schools as well. Henceforth, in Poland, teaching had to be in strictest accordance with the dicta of the church. The nobles, on their part, broke down the military strength of the kingdom through a law that the standing army should consist only of a guard of 1,200 men, the object being to make the ruler wholly subservient to them. The punishment for this selfish and unwise procedure of the nobles was not long in coming. We have already spoken of the constitution of the Cossack state proper, on the middle and lower Dnieper, which developed by Russian and Lithuanian fugitives, had received from King Stephen Bathory a firm organization under Polish suzerainty, yet resting on entirely independent military institutions. It soon acquired considerable power, and its undaunted warriors, not content with combating the Turks and Crim Tartars by land, took with equal skill and courage to the sea, and in their light boats plundered without cessation the shores of Asia Minor and the Balkan Peninsula, spreading terror into the very harbour of Constantinople. The port had often complained at Warsaw. This gave the Poles a pretext for attempting to exterminate not only the political freedom, but also the Greek religion of the Cossacks. First, these were compelled to renounce the election of their hetman, and to submit to the leadership of the Polish commander-in-chief. Then the Jesuits came into the land and shut up their churches, permitting only the worship of the so-called Greek Unionists, who acknowledged the authority of Rome. Ultimately, Polish nobles settled in the Ukraine and transformed the hitherto free Cossacks into serfs. As these repeatedly rose in revolt, the Poles, in their diet of 1638, took advantage of their rebellion to take from them all personal and political rights. The Cossacks found a leader in Bogdan Chmielnicki, whom a Polish noble had depraved of his land. As Chmielnicki could obtain no justice in Warsaw, he raised the banner of revolt in 1648. Forthwith, the whole Ukraine was under arms. The people of Little Russia, embittered by the Jesuit zeal for conversion, streamed into the camp of the new hetman. Even their former foes, the Tartars, greedy for Polish spoil, sent help. In the midst of these disorders, King Władysław IV died in 1648. The nobles wrangled for five weeks over the election of a king, to Zamość, with destruction in his train. At length, the exertions and the gold of the queen widow secured the election of John Casimir, brother of the deceased. The last of the house of Vaza, he had been, up to this time, a Jesuit and a cardinal. But the Pope freely released him from the priestly order. He proved, however, by no means equal to the situation. He first sought to win over Chmielnicki, but the Polish nobles would hear nothing of dealings with the despised quote-unquote peasants, and under the leadership of Jeremiah Wisniewiecki, 
fell suddenly on the unsuspecting Cossacks, massacring them mercilessly. This scandalous outrage fired the Cossacks with the wildest passion for revenge. Bogdan, in alliance with the Tartar Khan, Islam Gerai, vanquished the king and his array of nobles in various battles on the plain of Zborov, and so hemmed him in that he was forced to come to terms with the Cossacks. He had to grant to them their former practical independence, and to pay a yearly tribute to the Tartars. The Greco-Catholic metropolis of Kiev received a seat and a vote in the Polish Senate. From these experiences the Polish aristocracy might have drawn the conclusion that the welfare of their fatherland demanded a more centralized government. But in the Diet of 1652 the infamous Liberum Veto was declared a perpetual law. There had never really been any systematic voting in the Diet. The majority had been in the habit of simply shouting down the minority, or, if the latter did not acquiesce gracefully, of compelling them to submission by violence, and occasionally by murder. On one occasion, when the most important measures in regard to the defense of the kingdom against the Cossacks and Tartars were under consideration, one insignificant Lithuanian country member shouted into the hall, I dissent, and forthwith fled that he might not be compelled to change his vote. His friends and party maintained that, except by unanimous consent, the Diet could arrive at no valid decision, and this view, absurd as it is, they were able to enforce. The Diet separated without result. Thenceforth, any member had the power to nullify the proceedings of the Diet by the use of the Liberum Veto. Never has the passion for personal liberty carried a ruling class to so pernicious an extreme. To the caprice of the individual were sacrificed the peace, the greatness, nay, the very existence of the fatherland. While the nobles in this way doomed the kingdom to weakness and internal dissolution, they revoked the compact entered into with the Cossacks. Above all, the Jesuit party in the Senate would hear nothing of the admission of the schismatic metropolis, Kiev, into the Diet. Provoked by the constant insults and encroachments of the Poles, Bogdan Khmelnytsky once more took up arms. The Cossacks soon found a mightier ally than the Tartars. In 1654 they finally renounced Polish rule and placed themselves under the protection of their co-religionists, the Russians. The Tsar, Alexis Mikhailovich, gladly agreed to all their conditions. They were to be ruled by their own elected chiefs in accordance with their own laws and were to pay no tribute. Sixty thousand of them were to be enrolled for war service and receive regular pay from the Tsar. Henceforth, this martial people, instead of being a bulwark of Poland against Russia, became the frontier guard of Russia against Poland. With overpowering strength, in which religious zeal played no small part, the Russians and Cossacks repelled the attacks of the Poles, conquered White Russia and Lithuania, and even took the fortress of Lublin in Poland proper. With the political decline of Poland was associated her intellectual decadence. The preceding epoch of the Reformation is regarded as the golden age of Polish literature. Nicholas Ray, 1507-1568, celebrated sometimes the views of the reformers, sometimes the joys of love, and gave his robust humor expression in strongly spiced satires. Of much higher and finer endowments than this gifted country gentleman, was John Kochanowski, 1530-1584, the foremost of Poland's older poets. In him, profound knowledge of classical antiquity was associated with deep political feeling and the happiest mastery of expression. As a lyric poet, he was never equaled in Poland. Side by side with these noble authors stand the low-born Sebastian Klonowicz. His revolutionary temper found voice in powerful and racy but bitter verses. Prose was written almost exclusively in Latin. All the more credit, therefore, belongs to Lukas Gurnitsky's Courtier, which was written in Polish, and is an admirable mirror of the usages of the higher society of his time. The exciting political and religious life of the period exerted a stimulating influence on Polish oratory, of which some masterpieces remain. Under the direful rule of Sigismund III, the luster of Polish literature began to grow dim. The burghers were shut out not only from all participation in public life, but also from the higher education. 
even the nobles ceased to resort to foreign universities so perilous as they believed for their faith the university of cracow rapidly retrograded the authority of a tutelary and exclusive church interdicted all free investigation and independent thought the political disorganization and the self-seeking of the ruling caste enfeebled every higher national aspiration soon latin became the dominant literary language little except translations from the french appeared in the native tongue after long continued disorder russia had received a firm organization through the installation of the new dynasty of the house of romanov the tsar michael fedorovich was a well-meaning but weak prince who all his life was subservient to foreign influences the boyars availed themselves of this weakness to exert a considerable influence on the government but the situation was changed when after the peace of devolino the tsar's father the monk Filaretus returned from a Polish prison and was nominated by his son to the Patriarchate of Moscow. This energetic man became the joint ruler and caused the year of his rule as spiritual primate to appear on the public documents side by side with that of the temporal potentate, a custom continued by his successors in the patriarchal chair of Moscow. The boyars were once more deprived of all influence and reduced to their former state of vassalage the council of state was still called together on occasion of high importance and certain of its members were bold enough to express their views on the questions submitted but the decision of the czar was final michael and his successor alexis assembled on several occasions a general council consisting of two nobles and two burghers from each city but even here the members were only asked to express their opinions without the czar being in any way bound by them this was hardly a representative parliament, as some Slavophiles would have us believe. On the death of Tsar Michael, his son Alexis, a lad of sixteen, ascended the throne. At first the youthful prince was completely dependent on his tutor, the boyar, Boris Morozov, who, misusing his power, espoused his pupil to the daughter of a petty noble, whose sister he himself had married, and heaped offices and pensions upon his own and the Tsarina's relatives. Plundering of the people and scandalous misgovernment through Boris's protégés was now the rule in Russia. Commercial monopolies in the hands of the dominant families hampered traffic and increased the cost of the necessaries of life. At length the long-suffering populace of Moscow rose in wild revolt, 1648, not against the Tsar, but against his officials, and struck down a number of them alexis rescued moscow with difficulty and had to banish him from his presence and exclude him from all public offices alexis thereupon appointed a commission of nobles and ecclesiastics to compile a new code of laws july sixteen forty eight based on the rights of the church former edicts of the czar and decisions of the boyars a national convention in october sixteen forty eight recognized the new code which was then promulgated in all lands under the sceptre of the czar yet notwithstanding this wise and popular measure the land did not attain peace official dishonesty provoked new risings in novgorod and pskov in sixteen fifty some of which had to be suppressed by armed force to cut off the source of such outbreaks the czar constituted a new board which under various names had continued to the present day being now known as the chamber of secret affairs to it was entrusted the unconditional execution of the czar's decrees only insignificant persons were called to it for they would be blind tools of the sovereign authority and thus paved the way for unconditional and unlimited absolutism this strengthening of the power of the czar was of all the more importance because russia was soon involved in a long and decisive conflict with poland the cossack war sounded the signal among the results were the lasting subjugation of poland and the ultimate elevation of russia to be the foremost eastern power this change was made possible by the decadence of the ottoman empire which showed itself in all departments of government and first of that in finance in the time of Sultan Soliman the Great, a million ducats, about nine million six hundred and seventy seven thousand four hundred dollars, could be deposited a year in the treasury as surplus. Under his successor, conditions were reversed. 
the expenditure soon exceeded the income by as much as one-fourth thefts and embezzlements in all branches cooperated with the cupidity of the sultans who needed large sums for their pleasures to empty the treasury peculation was organized into the system the highest offices even the governorships of whole provinces the princely dignity in moldovia and in wallachia were sold at auction to the highest bidders no wonder that the purchasers sought to make up for this outlay by exactions from the miserable subjects who with no one beneath them to be preyed upon had to bear the whole intolerable burden the oppressive burden of the taxes the ignorance and indifference of the ephemeral officials produced widespread poverty misery and depopulation the husbandman cultivated only as many acres as would meet his barest needs for he knew that any surplus would be taken from him by violence in all quarters were to be seen deserted homesteads and houses falling to ruin the enormous extent of the ottoman empire the length of whose frontier was estimated at about fifteen thousand miles was an element of weakness rather than strength in asia the empire comprehended anatolia armenia mesopotamia syria palestine arabia in africa egypt tripoli tunis algiers in europe thrace bulgaria moldavia wallachia transylvania the greater part of hungary bosnia servia dalmatia albania macedonia and greece with the archipelago the fairest and most fertile districts of three continents from the tigris to the middle danube and almost to the pillars of hercules were subject to the sultans who instead of using their unbounded resources to make themselves masters of the world merely spread death and ruin over one's blooming and vigorous empires in the families of the sultans constant strifes and bloody conflicts arose among the wives or among their sons or between the sons and their father even under the great soliman such conflicts had taken place the grand viziers began to have weightier influence in state affairs than the sultans themselves who succumbed more and more to the intrigues of the harem the personal council of the vizier constituted the sublime port the highest political authority the most illustrious of the viziers were mohammed sokolli who through the christian origin rose under soliman to this foremost position and under selim the second became all-powerful it was due to him that turkey under the weak selim continued on the whole to maintain its position sokolli's ability uprightness and toleration for his former fellow-believers the christians were commended by all his well-informed contemporaries after ruling for fourteen years he fell in fifteen seventy nine by the dagger of a dervish to whom he did not appear sufficiently fanatical under the grand vizier and in conjunction with him ruled the divan a body composed of the highest officials of the empire and meeting regularly four times a week for the consideration of matters of policy administration and justice to it everyone could submit his case its decisions required confirmation by the sultan but this was seldom withheld the military power of turkey rested on its feudal cavalry every warrior being hereditary possessor of a fief larger or smaller the number of these sipahi spahis amounted to at least two hundred thousand organized by districts sanjaks under sanjak bays these again were organized into provinces eyalets under baylor bays or governors the military leaders being also the civil administrators of their respective districts the spahis laid the foundation of turkey's greatness but with increasing riches and effeminacy they lost their warlike spirit records was now had to paid spahis at first merely a sort of bodyguard but latterly increased in number to forty thousand heavy armed horsemen to these must be added the irregular cavalry who instead of receiving pay remunerated themselves by pillaging and the tartar moldavo wallachian georgian and other auxiliaries the total number of these horsemen was in the seventeenth century more than two hundred and twenty thousand and before firearms were perfected they were the main support of turkey's military supremacy meanwhile a reliable infantry was needed 
This was by preference composed of Christian boys who had been carried off from their parents, and who, after being trained in Islamism and subjected to discipline, were drafted into the corps of Janissaries. In 1638, under Murad IV, this compulsory enlistment was abolished, and even after, the corps consisted exclusively of volunteers. The service was severe and for life, but the position was held in honour and was well paid. Originally, the corps had been distinguished for its brotherly spirit, order, morality, and devoted heroism, but deterioration came with the admission of young Turks, to whom the privilege of marriage could not be denied, as it had been to the stolen offspring of Christians. Thus the military power of Turkey degenerated rapidly. The more disorganized the state of the exchequer, and the more irregularly the soldiers were paid, the more frequent were the revolts that sometimes led to bloody catastrophes. After the Battle of Lepanto, matters went even worse with the Turkish navy. The fleets lost confidence, and no longer ventured out of the harbours. The Turks, brave and enterprising by land, had ever felt themselves awkward and timid at sea. The poverty of the government also wrought evil. In the first half of the 17th century, the Turkish navy was reduced to 50 ships, which were fit only for the pettiest services. It must be admitted that the Osmanlis did not understand how to take advantage of their triumphs on European soil so as to evolve an enduring national organization. Rigid and severe in its forms, the government was always alien and hostile to its subject races. Culture remained the property of the few. Individual sultans favoured learning, but irrespective of some historical works, this was altogether of a religious character. There is a striking contrast between the literary barrenness of Turkey and the brilliant intellectual development that once distinguished their Arabian and Persian fellow believers. In the domain of politics, the condition of affairs was similar. Legislation was stationary, for it could not deviate an iota from the principles laid down in the Koran. The Christian subjects of the Turks were treated as mere cattle. No effects were made to convert them, although this would have greatly strengthened Turkey in the Balkan Peninsula and along the Danube. Nay, from pure selfishness, some sultans forbade conversions in large numbers to Islam, this would have involved the loss of the poll tax imposed on Christians and the conscription of their children. Revolts among the Christians were frequent, and were crushed only by the most brutal violence. The most striking proof of the Turks' incapacity for rule is the fact that they could dispense with the despised unbelievers neither in the administration nor in the army. Their hosts were mainly recruited from captive Christian children, and the higher administrative offices were almost exclusively occupied by Christians. Only by virtue of this peculiar system was Turkey able to maintain her integrity till toward the end of the 17th century. On the death of the debauchee Selim II in 1574, Mohamed Sokoli was successful in placing Selim's eldest son, Murad III, on the throne. He inaugurated his reign, in accordance with the ghastly Ottoman custom, by slaying his younger brothers. He soon plunged into the enervating excesses of the harem, and showed zeal for nothing save the scandalous plunderings of his subjects. By this plundering he obtained the means for the constant largesses by which the fidelity of his troops was secured. Yet in spite of the deplorable conduct of the administration, his adventurous provincial governors were able to extend his domains in Hungary at the cost of Austria. Meanwhile another war broke out, and this time with the oriental rival of the Ottoman Empire, Persia, 1578. This state was hostile to Turkey, not only on political grounds, but also on religious ones. The Persian sect of Shiites and the Turkish sect of Sunnites hated each other. After a war of twelve years, peace was concluded in 1590, on terms highly honorable for the Osmanlis. Persia ceded to them the whole of Georgia, as well as the provinces on the southwest coast of the Caspian. Yet, notwithstanding this brilliant result, the Persian campaigns were disastrous for the Turks. Their best armies, to the number, it is said, of 600,000 men, were destroyed, and their finances reduced to a state of hopeless disorder. 
The ill effects appeared prominently when the war against Emperor Rudolf II broke out anew in 1593. In this campaign the Turks suffered numerous defeats, and had it not been for the Emperor's frenzied passion for persecution and the risings of the Hungarians and Transylvanians under Bochkai, the port would have suffered heavy losses in the peace of Zhitva Torok in 1607. Meantime, Murad III had been replaced by his son, Mohammed III, and he by his brother, Ahmed I, but these insignificant princes exerted no material influence upon the course of political and military events. Ahmed soon found a formidable foe in the energetic and gifted Shah of Persia, Abbas the Great. This prince undertook to wrest from the Turks their conquests in the last war, and the real weakness of the Ottoman Empire was revealed. In the campaign from 1604 to 1619, all that the Turks had acquired since 1590 was lost. The Persian wars had exhausted the best strength of the state. The extent to which the decadence of the Turkish government had gone is shown by the fact that, on the death of Ahmed, in 1617, the Divan, that it might order matters at its own discretion, elevated his imbecile brother Mustafa to the throne. In three months he was deposed in favor of Osman II, the eldest son of Ahmed I. The new sultan was a high-spirited, chivalric youth, inspired above all with the ambition to restore the empire and his race to their ancient glory. But his warlike projects were not favored by the indolent Spahis and Janissaries. The failure of a campaign against Poland heightened the discontent. The Grand Vizier, the Minister of War, and other high functionaries and officers were massacred by the maddened soldiery. Finally, Osman himself shared their fate, the first case of regicide in Turkish history. The imbecile Mustafa was replaced on the throne, where he conducted himself in the most insane manner. At length the divan and the army alike recognized that an end must be put to such a deplorable condition of affairs. In 1623 Mustafa was relegated to the harem where he lived in obscurity for sixteen years, and Osman's brother, Murad IV, was set in his place. Murad, though like his murdered brother, a youth of energy and enterprise, gave way without restraint to his sensual passions and thus ultimately wrecked himself. He humbled the insolent arrogance of the Janissaries by terrible and repeated executions. External affairs soon demanded his active intervention. Several Asiatic pashas rose in revolt, and Shah Abbas the Great of Persia was ready to take advantage of these turmoils to extend his own dominions. In 1623 he made himself master of Baghdad, the capital of Mesopotamia, and the ancient residence of the Caliphs, and forthwith proceeded to further conquests. In 1628, luckily for the Osmanlis, he died, and his son, Sefi, was of far inferior capacity. Sultan Murat now undertook war in person against Persia, and conducted it with the fierce energy characteristic of his nature. He retook Erivan, Tabriz, and Van, and finally, in 1638, stormed Baghdad, which was now little more than a heap of ruins. In the next year, the long-protracted Persian war was brought to a close by a peace that left affairs very much as they were before it broke out. Murat now thought of turning his victorious arms against Christian Europe, which was rent by numberless conflicts. Christendom trembled at the threatening danger when, in 1640, the Sultan died, worn out prematurely by his debaucheries and passions. He had restored discipline and confidence to his army and order to his finances, but these reforms were based merely on fear, and everything depended on the character of those who should hereafter hold the reins of government. Ibrahim, Murat's youngest brother, who succeeded to the throne, was an innervated weakling. He had, however, able ministers who maintained the prestige of Turkey abroad, reorganized the fleet, and began in 1645 a war with Venice for the possession of Crete. In 1648, Ibrahim was murdered by the Janissaries, who thereupon placed his youthful son, Mohammed IV, upon the throne. The real masters of the empire were now the Janissaries, like the Praetorian guards in ancient Rome, and before their power, 
both the sovereign and his ministers trembled the destruction of the state seemed imminent but it was averted by a race of hereditary grand viziers who beginning with mohammed Kuprili in sixteen fifty six and holding office for a quarter of a century secured for the ottoman empire a new lease of life the alliance with france under louis the fourteenth effected at this time lends a fictitious importance to the position of turkey in european affairs in the middle of the seventeenth century End of Europe in the Middle Ages in the 17th Century, Part 2, by Martin Philipson.